now we're going to move into invertebrates. The first part of our invertebrates are going to be dealing with sponges, phylum periphera, and jellyfish, hydra, sea anemones, which are part of phylum nadirian. Now it's pronounced nadirian, you do not pronounce the C. Remember, invertebrates do not have a backbone. So we're going to focus on the sponges first, and this is phylum periphera. Sponges are filter feeders. They will take in food through a current of water through their pores. Remember, phylum periphera, they have pores. Water will enter the pores, bring in food. They have small little collar cells which have a flagella on them. These collar cells are at the bottom of the picture and they are also sticky. Food and different materials that are being taken in through the pores or porocytes, the little openings, are going to get stuck on the collar cells. It then will be moved up and out through the single large hole called the osculum. So the sponge will filter the water. It will take food and nutrients from the water and use that to get nutrients. Therefore, a sponge is a heterotroph. It's eating and absorbing and getting nutrients from other things that are already in the water. As we said, water enters the pore cell. Site meaning cell, so a porocyte is the pore cell. You can see porocyte in the picture. That's where water enters and then water will leave the main osculum, the large hole at the top. Surrounding the porocyte or the pore cell are the collar cells, and these collar cells have a flagella, these little whip-like structures. Now remember, we learned about a flagella in protus. Remember the euglena, giardia all had flagella. Some bacteria even have flagella. But this is going to be our, but remember, sponges are animals, and they will not use the flagella to swim around or move, but to create a current to bring food in so it can filter and absorb the nutrient. Because they have a flagella, it is called choanocytic. And we did learn what choanocytic refers to. There's another term, choanocytic, meaning having more than one nucleus, but that is not in this case. This is talking about having a flagella. Okay, here's a basic illustration of the movement of water entering the sponge through the pore cells because of the collar cells and then out the main hole called the osculum. And you can see the collar cell has a flagella. Sponges aren't just soft. Sponges do have two different types of skeletons, a hard skeleton called a spicule. Usually it's made up of calcium, so it's called a calcium spicule. And then it's made up of the soft part. The soft part is called spongin. And that's primarily what we would use if we were using a uh, once living sponge, an organic sponge, but today we primarily use synthetic or artificial sponges. We said all living animals respond to a stimuli or a touch. Sponges primarily are asymmetric, but some, but some of the tube sponges do have radial symmetry. Sponges will reproduce sexually. They do release a sperm, which is the male gamete, and an egg, which is the female gamete. But sponges will primarily reproduce asexually through budding or binary fission. The adult sponge is going to be non-moving, and because it's non-moving, it is called sessile. So sessile means does not move. Now, when the sponge is a larva, it is free swimming, but the adult sponge does not move. Back in the days before we had synthetic sponges for housework, cleaning sponges did come from the ocean. They were harvested by hard hat divers walking along the ocean floor in heavy weighted boots with a rake-like tool to pluck the sponges off the bottom. It was a dangerous and difficult job. Bagfuls of sponges were lifted to the boat above. Immediately the crew set to work cleaning the sponges. Then they were hung to air dry.
While an ocean sponge looks something like a weird plant, it's actually an animal. In fact, sponges are among the simplest multicellular animals on Earth. They live on the bottom of the ocean, attached to a surface and never moving because they can't walk or swim. Some are quite colorful, while others are drab. They also come in all shapes and sizes. There are tube sponges, vase sponges, barrel sponges, rope sponges, encrusting sponges, and many other types. Sponges live from the frigid waters of the Arctic and Antarctic to the tropics. On many coral reefs, sponges dominate the seafloor and the drop-off. One of the most common sponges on coral reefs is the barrel sponge. Barrel sponges grow to epic proportions, getting larger than a person. Although sponges can't walk or swim, they can feed. They do it by filtering tiny plankton from the water. A sponge is covered with small pores called ostea, which lead to a system of internal canals and eventually out to one or more larger holes called oscula. Within the canals of the sponge, chambers are lined with specialized cells called choanocytes or collar cells. The collar cells have a sticky funnel-shaped collar and a hair-like whip called a flagellum. The collar cells serve two purposes. First, they beat their flagella back and forth like fans to move water through the sponge. The water brings in nutrients and oxygen while it carries out waste and carbon dioxide. Second, the sticky collars of the collar cells pick up tiny bits of planktonic food brought in with the water. Sponges are very effective filter feeders since they're able to capture and eat particles as small as bacteria as well as larger particles. They might not look like they're doing much, but a simple demonstration shows how effectively sponges can pump water. On a reef in the Caribbean, I make a dive with a syringe filled with a non-toxic dye called fluorescein. By squirting it around the base of some sponges, we can observe how the water is moving by watching what the dye does. Within only seconds, the dye is pumped through the sponges along with the water. As you can see, a sponge is a pretty good water pump and also a good strainer. Any plankton that goes in with the water won't come back out through the osculum. Tube sponges are even more spectacular to observe. They pump the dye so furiously that they look like a collection of miniature smokestacks. What will a big monster like this do? It takes a few seconds for the dye to work its way through the sponge. Wait for it. But then it pours out like smoke from a chimney. That's pretty good pumping from those tiny little collar cells. Now we're going to move into phylum Nadiria. Remember, we do not pronounce the C. Nadirians include jellyfish, sea anemones, hydras or hydroids, and coral polyps. These are all nettle animals. Nettle animals, nettle means having the ability to sting. And these cells are actually called nematocytes. So the stinging cells are called nematocytes, and these are found on the tentacles. Because these animals have nematocytes, they are called nettle animals. And remember, site means cell, nemato is referring to stinging. So we're gonna call the little stinging cell a nematocyte, and then we're gonna call the animal that has the nematocyte a nettle animal. And where are these nematocytes usually located? on the tentacles. Now, Nadirians have a hollow gut, meaning an empty opening on the inside of their body. And because of that, there is a name given to them, and that is called a cholinterate. Nadirians have radial symmetry. They will have a center point 
and then it can branch off like spokes of a bicycle wheel. Now a great example that is not a nadirian is a sea star or starfish, but we'll get to that in some future chapters. But let's focus on specifically nadirians that have radial symmetry. Remember, we're talking about the jellyfish or the sea anemone, and we're not looking at the side, kind of like a candle. We're going to look at the top, okay? So they have this cylinder shape, and we're going to look at the top, and primarily in the sea anemone and coral polyp and the hydra, they're going to have a little mouth, a little opening at the top. But the interesting thing is there's no opening at the bottom. There's no anus. Nadirians have one opening. The mouth is the anus. So as food enters, goes into the hollow gut, and then it gets digested, and then it comes out the same opening. Because it has only one opening, that is called incomplete digestion. Cats, dogs, humans, earthworms, fish, they all have complete digestion. They have a mouth and an anus. Nadirians, however, do not have two openings. Now, nadirians will use their muscle fibers in their body to move, and the body consists of two layers, an outside and inside layer. The outside layer is called an ectoderm, ecto meaning outside, endoderm, endo meaning inside, and then there's a kind of this separation or this middle layer called the mesoderm or mesoglia. They don't have a respiratory system or an excretory system, uh, there is a basic nerve net where if they are touched, they will respond, they'll move their tentacles. Okay, so there is a, a response to stimuli. Just like the sponge, there will be sexual reproduction through the egg and sperm fertilization, uh, but there's also going to be asexual reproduction happening in many of the nadirians. And as many nadirians can have a polyp stage, which would be a sessile, non-moving stage, like a hydra or sea anemone, and then you also have a free-floating stage such as the jellyfish. Now, uh, the jellyfish we think of where it's free-floating, it's swimming all around. Now, the adult jellyfish is going to be that free-floating stage. If we look at number six to number one, basically that's the formation of the immature stage of the jellyfish, the polyp, and as that polyp grows, it will then uh, go through an asexual reproduction form, forming the jellyfish. Then the adult jellyfish, which is in the medusa stage, can then go through sexual reproduction. Now, don't confuse this with the hydra, sea anemone, and coral polyp. They are adults in the polyp stage, but the jellyfish is not a, a sea anemone or hydra turning into a jellyfish. This is the whole stage of the jellyfish. It starts as a polyp, a non-moving structure, and then through asexual reproduction forms the adult jellyfish that we normally think of. Okay, here's a picture of the jellyfish, which most of you are familiar with. But then we get to the hydra and sea anemone. Uh, basically, the hydra and sea anemone, many students are not familiar with. If you take a look at the hydra, you can see there's a small portion growing off the side of it. Uh, that is called budding. Remember, budding we learned before with yeast. Budding is a non-equal growth. You can also see on all of these, you can see the tentacles, and you may even see uh, the little nematocytes. Now the coral polyps at the bottom right, you heard of coral, and we think of coral as being this hard rock, but actually that's more of the skeleton coming off of that are all of these little tiny uh, flower-like structures, and those are the squishy little nadirians that have little tentacles and little nematocytes on them. Now, nadirians have two distinct body forms. I'll be showing you actually a couple of different kinds. They have what's called a polyp form, which is usually sessile, or it means meaning that it doesn't swim around or move around, or they have what's called a medusa form, which is a free swimming animal. And in this case, the jellyfish, in this stage of its development, um, is displaying the medusa form. Now, some nadarians display both types of forms during their life cycles, while others display um, only one. They display what's called radial symmetry. 
So to understand radial symmetry, we can think about a wheel. So if you think of a bicycle, a bicycle wheel, for example, you've got the, the round part on the outside, and then the wheel is divided by a series of spokes, okay? And in this case, the uh, true jellyfish display what's called tetramerous radial symmetry. Tetra means four, so it's basically a radial symmetry made up of multiples of four. And we can see that right away in a couple of the structures, these sort of whitish horseshoe shaped uh, bits down on the bottom and also these these longer pieces right here we can see there's four of those so everything on this animal is made up in multiples of four. Now all siphozoans, all true jellyfish have both of the two um, uh, body shapes that I mentioned earlier, so the polyp and the medusa form. In this case here, we're looking at a, a mature or adult animal, so it only ha this this is the medusa form, what we would think of as sort of a typical jellyfish. So we're mostly going to just focus on the external anatomy of this animal. This is um, the the underside of the animal here, and the main part of the body is this. Well, it looks round and flat here, but in life, it would actually be uh, curved like this, sort of parasol shaped, okay? And that part is called the bell, okay? So most of this flat surface here is called the bell. And a hydrostatic skeleton, so a water-based skeleton, is basically what allows it to maintain its shape. So obviously it doesn't have bones, there's no hard shell like on an insect, so it's just a, a water skeleton that keeps its shape. So the other thing that we find along the margin are tentacles. And if you look really closely, you'll see these really thin, filamentous, fluffy little things all along the margin. Those are, in fact, the tentacles. And they shouldn't be confused with these larger things. Most people see these long things and assume that these are the tentacles, but those are, in fact, what's called the oral arms or the arms. So the way these guys eat is the tentacles, these little filamenty things, are used to filter tiny, tiny prey, and then the oral arms, which are actually sort of trough-shaped, they, they, if you, you can sort of open them right here, so these trough-shaped oral arms collect or scoop this tiny filtered prey from along the margin, and it directs it in to the mouth, which is sort of right in the middle there. There's a hole there that goes to the mouth. So now we're looking at an animal called a sea anemone. Anemones are in the class Anthozoa, and these are marine animals, so they live in salt water, and you'll mostly find them in intertidal zones. Um, you'll find them pretty deep, too. They'll go up to 75 meters deep in the water. So now, unlike the moon jelly that we just observed, these guys only live in a polyp form, so you'll never find them in a medusa shape. They only live in this sessile, so non-swimming, polyp Form. So that's something that is um, a little bit different. So the body of the sea anemone is divided into three main regions. First we have the oral disc, which is this upper surface right here that contains the tentacles and the mouth. Next we have the column, which is the cylindrical shaped main body region in the middle right here that houses all of the the guts so to speak and then lastly we have the basal disc which is the underside the base of it and that's what it uses to attach itself to a substrate so um, it actually secretes sort of a sticky mucus it's like a sticky glandular secretion and that's what it uses to glue itself and also it, 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 they can glide very very slightly on whatever surface they happen to be on now if you've ever seen a sea anemone in life, you know that they don't usually look quite this squished. Uh, the column here, inside, and we'll see them in a moment, there's, there's a whole bunch of really strong muscles in there. And in death, those muscles have all been contracted. So the animal is basically completely compressed. In life, it would be much more st stretched out and nicer looking. So the tentacles, coming back to the, the oral disc here, the tentacles are all of these fluffy look th looking things up at the top here. And each of these tentacles is armed with those specialized structures that I mentioned on the jellyfish, the nidocytes. So those sting the prey or subdue the prey, and then food is drawn over these tentacles into the mouth, which is this um, obvious opening up here at the top of the oral disc. 